Hey guys, in today's video we are talking about calibrating your laser to maximize your accuracy. Now if you only make signs or inaccurate parts, this video is not going to be very useful, but it might be helpful anyway, so maybe stick around. Uh, so. I cannot express to you guys enough that I am just some guy on the internet. Uh, if anything in this video doesn't work for you, that's not my fault, okay? Uh, I'm doing this to repair my machine or to improve my machine, and I feel it'll work for me. I'm gonna share it with you. But if you don't understand what I'm talking about and you're just gonna wing it, uh, don't do it at all. I do not represent any companies that import machines, so your warranty is void if you do anything that I'm about to tell you. Mine's gone already. So, uh, so when talking about calibration, there's a few things that need to be done. So I guess to start, uh, what's going on with my machine is we noticed after we changed our power supply, we decided to cut a larger sample uh, to work out or to uh, start testing the beam profile to make sure it was cutting good. And when we did and we measured the square, uh, it was bigger than it was supposed to be. And that's not how lasers work. Usually they remove material, so they're supposed to end up a little bit smaller. Now, as it turns out, um, the machine's miscalibrated slightly from the factory. Uh, luckily, I had a piece that was of a known size from a year ago. Actually, it was from the video that we did talking about compressed air versus oxygen. Uh, I actually still had those sample pieces uh, uh, riding around in my truck because I sometimes show people uh, what lasers can do. So I had that and I was able to measure it and I knew how big it was supposed to be and I noticed it was nine thousandths of an inch oversized in nine inches. So that's about one tenth of a percent off um, but that was consistent with what we were testing here so after we knew that then we were able to determine that the machine is slightly out of calibration and we think we know how to fix it so a few things that you're going to need to do in order to begin understanding how to do this. This is a kind of higher precision stuff. Uh, the first thing we you need to do is you need to cut a square inside of a square. And the reason you need to do this is you're trying to measure the width of your beam. Now you can do this with a feeler gauge and that'll get you close, uh, but the most precise way you can do it is to cut a square, then you measure the widest point out here with a micrometer and then you measure the width here, here, and here, and you subtract the three smaller numbers from the bigger number. And you're gonna be left with a really tiny number, and then you're gonna divide that by two. And that is going to give you one laser width. And if you're uh, doing compensation, you'll divide that by two one more time, and that will give you half a laser width, and that's how far you step off of your parts to make perfectly accurate parts when your machine's calibrated correctly. But once you know your laser beam width, then you can move on to a little bit more precise stuff. Now mine works out to four thousandths of an inch wide, uh, or um, 0.11 millimeter. All right, that's how wide the beam width is. That's how much is being obliterated by the laser. Uh, and this measurement is not affected um, by the laser being out of calibration. Like if you just cut a square and then measure how much is missing, uh, if the machine's out of calibration, you don't know how much was actually removed by the laser and how much is off or crooked with your machine. Another good tool to make, uh, I've been calling this one the... Oh, up. Yep. All right, my bad. Um, I've been calling this one the inside out square. Um, and the reason why it's a 50 millimeter square, but all of the sides were made using inside corners. So if you make uh, a regular square and this square and then measure the difference, this will tell you how much backlash you have. Because essentially, when you're cutting a normal square, the machine is decelerating away from the center. And when you cut this square, the machine is decelerating toward the center, the opposite direction. Thereby, if there's any backlash, you're going to see it 
really fast in these two pieces. And these pieces will be cut without using compensate. And you're going to want to start on the larger, on this piece, you're going to want to start in one of these outside areas. It don't start here because your machine, you don't know how the machine approached to that spot. So you start out here and then you know that the machine will accelerate toward the center. Hopefully that all makes sense. All right. Next on your calibration journey is you're going to make this is the same part, but you need to turn them 90 degrees to each other. So I marked which direction was the x-axis. This is x, this is x, and I turned them sideways. And this one really shows what's going on with the y-axis. So my machine's set up in metric, but my tools I have to measure are imperial. So I made this one so that each one of these steps is one inch bigger than the last. And then I just wrote down the last three digits of the caliper. So this is 0.996, and this would be 1.999. But you can see each one gets a little bit bigger than the last. Uh, and it's consistent, which means that the motors are moving it a little farther each time. And this is not backlash. If it was backlash, um, these would all be pretty much the same over or undersized if it was backlash. But since they're consistently growing bigger and bigger, that means the machine is commanding to the wrong position. The other axis, oh, one other thing that's important to note when you're doing this is the rotational direction. Oh, you can see yourself? I can see myself. You're, yeah. <laughs> he's messing with me and the camera. All right, the rotational direction is important because you want to think of the direction that the machine decelerates. So if it was, let's say, loose, it would overshoot, 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 and then keep going in the same direction. You don't want to measure this direction because when the machine's coming into these corners, it's decelerating toward this other dimension. So you want. In a shape like this, you want it to go around clockwise, and same with this. That way, it's always moving the machine in the same direction. I was originally going to make this each an inch in this direction and this direction, and then I realized that uh, one of the directions, it would be an inside corner, and the other one, it would be an outside corner. So hopefully, that makes sense. Uh, now we're going to jump over to the screen. So you should be seeing a picture right now. So right now we've opened up Sipe Config. Uh, if you're using Sipe software on your machine, you will also have Sipe Config somewhere because somebody has to configure the uh, machine's parameters, and this is how you would do it. The password to access it is 61259023, and that's standard on all Sipe software, as far as I know. Uh, it can be changed after the fact, so I apologize to the plant managers that are trying to keep the grunts out of the software. I just gave them control, so I'm sorry. Sorry, but uh, so as we can see, the x axis is set up to move 139.9262 millimeters per 73,040 pulses. Now, the rotational servos that are driving the machine forward and backward don't think in inches or millimeters or distance, they think in rotations. So it sends a certain number of pulses to equal a rotation, and that rotation equals a distance. So this menu right here is filling in of what equals what. So what we're going to do, since I don't know how to tell the machine to move 73,040 pulses, I'm going to instead tell the machine to do exactly what these boxes say. And that is to move 1,000 or uh, 139 millimeter, 139.9262 millimeters by 140.0399 millimeters. And that's going to equal 73,040 pulses of rotation for the servos. I know that's a bit of a mouthful. I'm sorry if that's a little bit confusing. But basically, we're going to make a slightly crooked um, square, and then we're going to measure what it is and add on one laser width. That's why you had to do that first piece in the beginning of the video. If you skipped forward to this point, back up and rewatch that part. Um, so you're going to measure what you ended up with and then add on a laser width onto that. So half a laser width per side, so one laser width. And then you're going to change these boxes to say what the piece of metal came out at. Now, I should have mentioned already 
that you need to already be cutting good quality cuts at this point to be calibrating this. This is not fixing bad cutting, this is fixing crooked cutting. Um, so if you're cutting bad, you gotta fix that, that's a different issue. Before you remove the part, any part from a machine when you're doing calibration, mark what direction is the x-axis. And also by putting a sharpie mark on it, you're also going to mark what side's up. Might come in handy later. Alright, so here's the piece. Uh, I measured it in both directions. I only have a uh, inch caliper. So they both came out the same size actually, 5.512, which works out to 140.0048 millimeter. I know calipers are not that accurate, it's off a of conversion, but it's the best I can do. Now, both sizes were the same, so uh, I only have to do the math once. So it ended up being, so this is the, the size of it, plus one laser width, because there's gonna be a half a width of removal on either side, which you have to add back in because we want to know where the center of the path is, not the edge of the beam. All right, so that works out to uh, 140.1148. So we're going to input that back in and see if we've corrected our problem. Well, there you have it. You see that method? Uh, we just measured the two things, dialed that in the machine. It worked perfectly, definitely on the first try. I mean, you know, okay, we made a lot of scrap metal testing it. So this did work. Um, but the problem is I only have a caliper and calipers are eh, not great at giving you perfect dimensions. If I had a micrometer big enough, I would have used that instead. The math mostly worked. Um, what we ended up doing is cutting these. These go in inches and the caliper reads those a little bit easier and you got more points of reference to try. And then what we were doing, we, were, we only had trouble with the x-axis after this setup. Uh, the Y came right into where it was supposed to, but the X kept giving us trouble, so we had to keep tweaking the numbers. Now, if we go over here, uh, this, these two numbers, these did work exactly as we thought they did. Now, simple rule of thumb, if you're doing a little fine tweaking, the smaller that number is, the bigger the part comes out. And, of course, obviously the reverse is true. The bigger this number is, so if you make this 145, the part will come out smaller. Um, anyway, uh, that's it. I hope this was helpful. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, I thought I would uh, share a little video with you guys. We are doing a little bit of stress testing on our machine. We've had this one for about three years, but we just did a upgrade to it. So uh, we started doing a little bit more extensive testing uh, to verify accuracy and things like that. And we started running into some little quirks. Um, mostly because the machine's more powerful, we kind of turned our accelerations up a little bit. So I wanted to show you a good little test sample you can do on your machine to see if you're running into the same issue. So these are 3 16 holes. The rest is done in metric. It's kind of a, we're a weird shop. We have uh, inch measuring tools, but the machine's all set up in millimeters. So we started with this one. Uh, it cuts this hole, then this hole, then this hole, then this hole. And what it's doing by doing that is it cuts and then it accelerates toward this hole and then stops and cuts it. So uh, what happens is when we measure this, so you can get it on that caliper, you can see this hole is on the 60 and this hole is around 70. This caliper is not perfect, 60 and 70. So what's happening is the laser is overshooting on the hole and then it overshoots in this direction back. So that's 10 thousandths off is off five thousandths in either direction but that's a big problem uh, we tried changing the accuracy uh, settings on the machine we disabled the pitch adjustment that was not set up at all at the factory I forgot what I did on this one these are all exactly the same effectively we doubled the size of the part that way it would move farther apart and it got a little worse maybe of course my caliper could be off went to half the size and it's about the same then finally this one, we changed the move acceleration from 4,000 millimeters a second to 2,000 millimeters a second and we basically solved the problem. This is only 2,000 off. That is perfectly acceptable for anything I'm doing. But if you guys wouldn't mind 
try running a part like this and make sure you uh, have the machine accelerate in opposite directions. Cut it out, test it, and let me know what you guys end up with your machine because I think it might be really interesting for other people to know uh, what this move acceleration in your, um, it's called global parameters. You can tweak this, make sure you know what you have first. But if we kind of had a baseline of what other people's machines are doing, that might be valuable information if you're ever doing precision work. All right, thanks, guys.